Well, thanks. Uh, thank you. It's a delight to be here, although I'm skeptical as to whether I should uh, uh, be speaking because I'm already the fourth or fifth m male speaker. So, Annika, if you want, we can skip this and go directly to the next one. No? Don't worry. Yeah. Just make a mark here. Okay, well, let's do. Well, fourth. let's, let's uh, at least do this. Don't so that we get a bit, bit of a balance here. Um, what I'm going to do, if I get uh, uh, the slides up here, is, is to, uh, tell about two things that have been involved in Finland that has, uh, whose aim has been to promote uh, women in business. And there are two examples, and uh, I'm sure there are similar ones here and elsewhere, but uh, just as concrete things that we've done in Finland. One has to do uh, with a think tank called EVA, Nariks Leavets Delegation, Posvenska, that I used to head, uh, and that had to do with uh, a, uh, an initiative that we took about 12 years ago, and the other one is well, which uh, uh, took place when I was head of Finland's Chambers of Commerce, and it's still continuing. So two examples, but let's start with uh, what uh, Annika already referred to. Uh, we all need role models, and that's my role model, my mother. And when it comes to sort of gender stereotypes, I think that, um, well, there's a, a woman in her working place. And uh, uh, that to me has always tell the, uh, told the story that uh, when it comes to women in business or workplace, the sky is the limit or not even the sky. So uh, this is, has been a starting point for me and actually um, uh, the only uh, sort of uh, negative side with that is that I al also have two daughters and I'm, I'm, I'm scared as to what the genes will lead them to do. But uh, so that's, that's my role model and stories are important. So uh, the two examples from Finland. Um, uh, 12 years ago, uh, this think tank, we started a project called Women to the Top. It wasn't invented in Finland. They had a similar project going on in uh, Sweden. Uh, the think tank happens to have on its board all the heavyweights from Finnish business. Most of them were men, but they recognized that this is something that ought to be done. Uh, and uh, the second one was uh, a mentoring project for women. Uh, and uh, this was uh, a project that uh, actually won the world championship in the chambers of commerce in the world regarding uh, the most impactful social projects. So those two are the, th the things that I've been personally involved. I'll just tell a couple of things about them. Uh, and the most important thing, I suppose, is this. That when we started, Finnish business was, and still is, but very dominant, very dominated by men. So we thought that we have to get men involved in this. And Antti Herlin, who's still chairman of Kone, started to chair this uh, project, Women to the Top, and it ended with uh, recommendations being written to all listed companies in Finland, saying that, one, you should pay attention to this, you should include this in your strategic thinking, you should also introduce targets. Because as you know, in business, nothing happens if you have no targets. So that sort of, I think, that started a movement within listed companies to recognize that we too should be doing something about it. So that's, I suppose, my first point, uh, he for she. The second ingredient that we had in these projects was it was all fact-based. We didn't make the argument that you should do this because it's politically correct. We've made the argument that you should do this because it makes sense. So what we did, we were, did a study uh, of all Finnish companies that employ more than 10 people and looked at their productivity and then uh, compared that to women, women in uh, executive roles in the board and that sort of thing. And uh, it was a very serious academic exercise. And finally, 
the results were quite clear that the more the companies where you had more women performed better in terms of profitability and in terms of increasing profitability when women are int introduced into the companies. So this was uh, number one, uh, looking at the companies themselves. Then number two, looking at all the data in Finland regarding uh, the reviews of women managers and directors. And these are uh, these 360 evaluations that most of you have done in your careers. And it turns out that women got better marks on, uh, from their colleagues, from their supervisors, from everyone else, but the only ones who didn't get high remarks to uh, women managers and directors were women them themselves. Um, that was the only bit. But every, in all the other uh, respects, aspects, uh, they were getting higher marks. And then when you add to this that academically women at least in Finland, perform better both in school and in universities, you start to get a quite a convincing argument that it just doesn't make sense not to introduce more women into business uh, in central positions. Now, there are recommendations. I'm happy to include a link in this presentation that you will probably get to sort of 20 recommendations that were, were uh, given as a result of these two projects, and, and they uh, include all sorts of things. But I think that taking the most important thing from the business is put it in your strategy and have targets. When it comes to women themselves, the most important thing is to have self-confidence. It, see, it turned out constantly when we did this uh, that, that women had a much higher threshold to apply for a position than a male colleague. That there was more self-doubt, can I do this or not? And as a result of, of this project, for example, the rector of the uh, Finnish University of, of Arts, she finally said she was in the, on the steering board of this project, and she said she would have never applied to be the rector of the university if she hadn't been involved, because she would have always thought, oh, I'm not good enough. So that uh, came out clearly as a message for women. And the third uh, sort of message that came out uh, was that, uh, that it has been a long time coming. Quite a lot of, uh, even if looking at sort of um, changes in attitudes, it's quite clear that young people are much more accepting of gender equality, and there are no problems with that. And another argument that we made that it's changing now because as young people enter the workforce, they will demand this. But there were quite a lot of people who said, well, this has been talked about for 20 years. It still hasn't happened. We don't believe it's going to happen. And uh, so that was 12 years ago when we started. I think that it is finally happening. And, uh, and over the past 10 years, uh, I think that there has been a remarkable movement worldwide and also to some extent in Finland. And just a couple of facts. Uh, Finland today, and when I say Finland today, it's actually this morning because the, la the latest statistics were um, revealed this morning. And you may say that, okay, it's not still perfect, but uh, if you look at listed companies and women board members across the board, 30%, 29% are now uh, uh, have uh, 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 women board members and 39 of, uh, no, sorry, the number of women in, in the boards, not as many uh, boards that have women. The number of women overall is 39% for all and 34% for large cap companies. But then if you look at uh, women CEOs, the numbers are quite low, as you can still uh, see. And uh, this is 
actually, normally the path, as you all know, to becoming a board member is that you have been a CEO of a company, and then you're appointed to the board of another company. But if the numbers are so low as they are there, then you have to open up the board uh, selection process to, uh, to um, uh, other roles than CEOs as well. The EU average, as you see, is 6.3, so we are slightly better in uh, Finland and Sweden, but the numbers overall are quite low. Then if you look at uh, uh, listed companies, executive management, uh, uh, it came, uh, it's now 25% of uh, uh, listed companies' uh, executive teams uh, consist of women, and a year ago it was still 23%, so it's moving forward. Um, and finally, another argument that uh, things may be moving on, uh, not only uh, in this part of the world, but also uh, more broadly. If you look at the Bloomberg Business Week, 50 companies to watch this year, this was just published a week ago or so, uh, one of the criteria that they look at is female board membership. And it's actually quite interesting uh, to look at. They vary quite a bit. Some of them are uh, 40, some of them are up to 60% of women. But the most important thing I think here is that it's included as one of the criteria to be looked at. So uh, we heard that uh, in Iceland, uh, there was a heavy emphasis on legislation, and that's a very good argument. But uh, uh, it comes to the question of, do you need quotas when it comes to board membership and other issues or not? And intelligent people may differ. I happen to be on the side of no quotas for two reasons. Uh, one, self-regulation seems to be working. Over the past 10 years, there has been a huge movement, and I could argue uh, and would argue that we've reached a tipping point. There isn't one listed company in Finland who would say that we do not need more women in, on our boards or in our executive teams. This is a no-brainer. Everyone said, yes, of course. So I think that we've already reached the point where things are moving forward, and if you look at the statistics, then uh, th that seems to be happening. The second point uh, is that if we then go to quotas, then there are some, all, uh, some additional problems or additional things that you should think about. Look at Norway, where they introduced 40% quotas for women on boards. The numbers of women on executive teams has actually decreased. And what we've, you've seen is the same women having up to eight positions on listed companies. So what you see in Norway is that, yes, in terms of numbers, you have 40%, but it's a small circle of women who hold these positions. At the same time, the executive team uh, uh, numbers do not look very good. So, yes, we can disagree, but I think that uh, we are moving in a direction, in Finland at least, and in some of the other countries, where it seems to be happening without that. Finally, it's not about women and men only. For example, Kone, uh, a leading lift company uh, in Finland, they looked at this 12 years ago when we started the project and, and then came to the conclusion that, yes, having women and men in an engineering company is important, but that's not enough if you have a global company. So what they did was they introduced a recruiting process where one on the short list, you had to have women and men, and somebody from outside of Finland, because the headquarters is in Finland always. So that was number one. Number two, that the people who made the recruitment decision, there were always two. 
and one would be woman and the other one would be man and, and hopefully one of them from outside Finland or you could have both outside of Finland. And this, of course, introduces the element of, uh, of uh, not looking at the mirror and choosing somebody who comes from the same background, whether it's uh, an engineering school or whatever. So in terms of uh, diversity, I think it is important that when you create a recruitment process that you look at broader issues. Gender is important, but it's not the, uh, the only uh, issue that counts when it comes to diversity uh, and the benefits that it can bring both to the board and to company leadership. So finally, I, the last uh, is just, just something I believe in. Uh, in the last century, we, uh, the world spoke about the Nordic model. Uh, it was very sort of political driven model. And it was hugely important. Now I think that Nordic values are actually being presented best by Nordic companies. And if you look at the way Nordic companies are performing in some of these issues, you can come to the conclusion that the more Nordic companies you have across the world, the better world we have. So I believed in that uh, promoting Nordic companies and Nordic values in the same package, and that's where I would conclude. Thank you. So does anybody want to ask anything from uh, Risto? You have to be quick now. Yeah, really, like really quick. Seconds are left. Questions, questions to Finland? Okay, here you. This is, this is the microphone. Oh, okay. Come back here. Okay, thank you. I'm Rosa from Iceland, from the country where we have chosen to uh, make all these legislative measures with some success. But uh, we, do, uh, we did follow the Norwegian example with quotas, but without the fines. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has brought success. And uh, it has changed the mindset uh, of, of people you know, in the economy. So I think that's the greatest success, as you, as you said. So these are different approaches. But you uh, talked about uh, that those the women, you know, that sit on boards of companies, it tends to be the same women. But in Iceland, uh, we, it, it looks the same, but also for the men's, you know, because it's a rather small group of men that, uh, you know, it's a profession. And uh, that's the case in Norway as well. So um, is the, you know, is, is the, yeah, could, could you elaborate a, a bit on that? Yeah, well, wonderful uh, question and to the point. Uh, yes, uh, first is uh, about being a board member as a profession. I would argue that that is not the best way to go. I think that to, to be a board member, you have to have broad experience and you may end up uh, becoming a, a board member in a couple of companies when you retire and that's fine. But if you take it as a uh, profession, that you are a professional board member, then the distance between doing business and being in governance role becomes too great. So I think that depends on how you define success. If you define success in terms of numbers, yes, that's fine. If you then you would almost need to go and look at how these companies are performing, who have sort of professional board members, uh, majority of them. Yes, in Finland, we in the 15, 20 years ago, the same number of small number of men populated all the companies, we've got rid of that. I mean, it's quite clear that nobody, uh, uh, that if you are CEO of a major company, you no longer have more than one outside position, two at the very most. So I, that would be my, 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 my reaction to what you said. Um, but uh, by and large, I think that this is uh, 
a decision that each nation has to take for itself. I wouldn't be able to say what's best for Estonia or, uh, or for, for Iceland. But in Finland, for a long time, we felt that things are not moving forward without quotas. Now they seem to be, we'll have to reevaluate it in a few years and see whether that's enough. But what do you think, Krista? Yeah. How come in America, in the United States, uh, these percentages are so much more higher for uh, for CEOs and board yes. members. Well, that um, I I don't know. I, I I think that I was going to say that there's uh, something, but it's uh, let's go to, into politically sensitive areas. Uh, there's something that has been is much discussed now, which is the uh, gender equality paradox. And the argument that's now out there is that if you have equal opportunities, people will still make different choices. And in the US, the role model of being an executive uh, is so attractive uh, because of the compensation packages and that sort of thing, that that itself leads ambitious people, be them women or men, to go for it when the uh, sort of the uh, packages are not quite as attractive in the Nordics or Europe, that's less incentive. I'm not sure I buy that argument, but that's what's been sort of Maybe suggested. Yeah. We need to have better uh, packages then. <laughs> that's probably it. <laughs> Thank you, Rista. Thank you. Thanks for coming and have a safe flight back.